This is a glorious time of the year. Thank you for joining us in worship during this Advent season. We are seeking to declutter our lives, declutter our hearts, prepare the way to receive more of the Lord's presence and work in our lives. Now, my friends, let us worship God. Good morning, friends. Thank you for worshiping with us at Wesley Memorial Methodist Church during this Advent season. Let us pray together. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of eternal life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
Our text for this, the second Sunday of Advent, comes from the last book of the Old Testament, the prophecy of Malachi, chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. See, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you, who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On that day when I act, says the Lord of hosts, remember the teaching of my servant Moses, the statutes and ordinances that I have commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. This is how the Old Testament ends. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. This is the second Sunday in Advent. Advent, as we discussed last week, comes from the Latin word adventus, which means a coming toward or an arrival. And during the season of Advent, we look at Jesus' first Advent there, his nativity in Bethlehem, but we also look during this season toward his second Advent his glorious return at the end of history. This text before us this morning that we find in the last book of the Old Testament from the prophecy of Malachi intertwines prophecies concerning both the first and the second advent of Jesus. And many of the scriptures in the Old Testament do it this way. It's like looking at a mountain range from a great distance. You see the mountains, but you're not really sure. You cannot quite discern how far apart those mountains are. So frequently when we read these texts in the Old Testament, we see these prophecies of the coming of Jesus intertwined. Some were fulfilled at his first advent. Some will be fulfilled at his second advent. Here in chapter 4 of Malachi, the very last words of the Old Testament, we see the prophet describing that great day of the Lord when God will do a marvelous work of intervention in human history and set all things right. You see in this text that he says to us that there will be people who aren't prepared to receive him when he comes. Beginning at verse 1, chapter 4, see the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. He is coming like a refiner's fire. He is coming to purge. And those who aren't prepared will be burned up, it says. They will be totally destroyed. There will neither be root nor branch remaining. So that's how Malachi begins discussing the day of the Lord that is to come. By looking at the reality that there will be people who have not prepared the way for the coming of the Lord. But then he turns very quickly to talk about the people who will be ready, the people who will have prepared to receive the new work of God, that great and glorious and dreadful day. Beginning at verse 2, he speaks of these people who are prepared by saying, But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, And you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. This is a beautiful picture for those who will be ready 
prepared to receive the day of the Lord. You notice the prophet says that when he comes, he will come like the sun of righteousness rising. He will come as the sun of righteousness rising with healing in its wings. In the ancient world, the sun frequently was depicted as a disk with wings because they felt as if the sun revolved around the earth. And here in the text, Malachi is using that image to say that when he comes, he will come as a sun of righteousness and he'll have healing in his wings. The sun can bring both life and death, can bring both growth and destruction. That's true for the sun that enlightens our world today. It can both soften and harden. It can destroy and it can give life. It it depends upon how that sunlight is received. That's how Malachi is painting a picture of the return of the Lord. He'll have healing in his wings, but he will be a bright and brilliant sun. And then there's an amazing image here in the prophecy. He says, when that day comes, when God will finish God's work in the world, you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. Try to picture that image. Here are calves. They are, they are shut up in a stall. They're being fattened for slaughter. But then the stall gates are open. And these calves go forth in freedom, rollicking in joy for this new day. So we see this day that is to come, that day, as a day of great joy, as a day of great freedom for those who are prepared for his coming. You you see that also the followers, those who are devoted to God, who revere God's name, those who worship God, they will participate in God's rule of the final kingdom. Jesus promised that. We see that promise throughout the Old Testament. We will be part of that glorious day. And God in Christ will continue to rule through us. We see this text here in Malachi and we hopefully hear strains of that great Christmas hymn that Charles Wesley wrote. Hark the herald angels sing. Perhaps you recall the verse, Hail the heaven-born prince of peace. Hail the son of righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. This is an amazing portrait of what that final glorious and dreadful day of the Lord will look like. When God in Christ will set everything right, will refresh, renew, recreate all of creation. I'm glad Malachi goes on to say, after he's painted this picture of that day, that glorious, dreadful day of the Lord, he goes on to say what we're to do as we wait for the coming of that day. We are a people in waiting. Waiting is an important part of the spiritual life knowing how to patiently wait. Patience really is a virtue. As we grow in the spiritual life, we should grow in the gift of patience. And the way that we grow in the gift of patience is that we understand that waiting is not simply a passive activity. Waiting is not a period when nothing is happening, but waiting is an important period in our lives. We need to understand that throughout the spiritual life, frequently that which God does in us while we wait is almost as important as that for which we wait. God is always working in our lives. That's why we can value those seasons, those periods of waiting. We know that God is working in us. I'm grateful that Malachi here in this text, after he paints the picture of the day. He talks about what we can do as we wait. Look at verse 4. Remember the teaching of my servant Moses, the statutes and ordinances that I have commanded him at Horeb 
for all Israel. Horeb's another Bible name for Sinai. So the prophet is reminding us to think about the law of God. Now in Christ, the civil law of Moses, the ceremonial law of Moses have been fulfilled, but the moral law still stands. The moral law still speaks to us about God's will, God's wish for our lives. That's why we as Christians still pay attention to the moral law, such as the Ten Commandments. So while we're waiting, we are growing. We are learning more and more of what God wants from us in this life. We are being trained in righteousness, prepared for the next kingdom. We're letting God do God's work in us as God continues to reveal his way to us. And then he also says that as we wait, we not only remember God's will for our lives, but there will be preaching. There'll be preaching and teaching in those days before the end. Here are the final words of the Old Testament. Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, he will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. Those are the closing words of the Old Testament. You notice here that Malachi is saying that before he comes, there will be, there will be someone like the prophet Elijah, almost a return of Elijah to prepare the way. Well, we know in the New Testament that there was an Elijah-type figure, John the Baptizer, who was the forerunner, who through the preaching of repentance, he was turning people back toward God. And that was preparing for the receiving of the Messiah. So there was that Elijah figure before the first advent. In the book of Revelation, in the New Testament, in, in, in that book of Revelation, in that amazing vision, in chapter 11, there is, there is a picture of the, in the vision of two, two great preachers coming before the end and they're painted as if they were return of Moses and Elijah before the second advent of Jesus. Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. There will be sufficient and adequate preaching before the end so that hearts can be turned. The word used here, turned, is the same word shuv, which is Hebrew for turning to God in repentance. There will be opportunities for people to turn. There will be opportunities for people to repent and to walk toward God instead of walking away from God. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. Again, that's how the Old Testament ends. So these, these preachers, this preaching that will precede the first advent, that will precede the second advent, will help people be reconciled to God and help people therefore be reconciled to each other. And that will eradicate, that will lift the curse that creation has borne since the Garden of Eden. It is fascinating to me, and this has not been lost on the Christian community for the last 2,000 years, that the last word of the Old Testament as we have it organized, with Malachi coming at the end, ends with the word curse. And of course, when we see that word, our mind does go back to the beginning of the Old Testament. It goes back to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, and the fall of the human race into rebellion. We remember how a curse came upon creation and the human race there in Genesis 3. The snake was cursed to crawl upon his belly for all of the rest of his existence, eating 
eating the dust of the earth. The woman was cursed with the pangs of childbirth. Man was cursed to toil all the days of his life. And they are reminded there in Genesis 3, at the end of the account of the fall, that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So we are reminded, as the Apostle Paul says in the New Testament, that we in creation today are in bondage. We are the product of the fall. We are still under that curse. But something's going to change about the curse. When you turn the page from the prophecy of Malachi, you turn into the New Testament, you turn to the Gospels, you turn to the Gospel of Matthew, and we're taught that as we move into the Gospel of Matthew, that in Christ the curse is lifted, and we begin our journey back to the Garden of Eden. Creation now is in the process of being renewed. Pain, toil, death are being banished, vanquished. We turn toward, as we go into the New Testament, we turn toward the glory of the gospel that renews all things, renews human beings, and eventually will renew all of creation. That day is coming. That day is coming. It is assured throughout the Old Testament and assured throughout the New Testament. God in Christ began his work at the first advent. And God in Christ will complete, consummate his work at the second advent. We have a God who intervenes, a God who interrupts, a God who acts in history. In the meantime, we wait. In the meantime, we wait and we begin to taste that freedom and joy and peace of that day that is to come. His first advent assured it. The work was begun. And then in his second advent, the second coming of Christ, the return of Christ, he will complete this work of renewal. This is the glory of the gospel. The Old Testament ends with the word curse. The New Testament is the promise of Christ for us. Amen.
Friends, thank you for worshiping with us here today at Wesley Memorial Church. Your support, your financial contributions keep us on the air. We seek to spread the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and transform the world around us. May you have a blessed Advent season, and then when it comes, a joy-filled Christmas. And may the blessing of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and abide with you always. Amen. Amen.